dare great things for Christ. Christ calls us to dare great things. In the marketplace, as well as in the mission field, there has never been a time like the present for the spirit of the Catholic entrepreneur. Now is the time for men and women of great courage and great vision to engage our church and our culture. Now is the time to dare great things. And here is your host as we dare great things, Father Nathan Cromley, the president and founder of the St. John Institute. Christian leaders have to do something difficult. We have to constantly balance asserting ourselves and using our talents and being humble before God. Errors can happen in both ways, either by not asserting ourselves or by losing sight of the service we render to Jesus. St. Paul was not unaware of this challenge. In 1 Timothy 5 and 6, he shows St. Timothy the way to make this proper balance and exhorts him to lead while being a friend of Christ. I'm so glad that you all made the time to come today to read this word with me. 1 Timothy 5 and 6. This is the end of the first letter of St. Paul to Timothy. And we're reading it in particular to try to understand what God's message to us is as leaders today. I'm convinced that, that the Bible st still teaches us things that are relevant, actually teaches us everything that's relevant about leading and is the greatest leadership book ever written because it was written by God himself and it was written for us so that we could exert the influence that he wants us to exert in this world by being taught by him. I mean, think about it. The, the one who formed the apostles to go and evangelize and change the entire world, the one who sent the disciples to form a culture that would carry the gospel, don't you think that he would want to instruct them in how to do that? I think sometimes we think leadership is just so automatic or is just it's something that we don't think we need to really study or have a background in, but that's not true. Just like anything that's a deliberate act it has its own structure and its own science to it. And God who sends us on a mission never sends us without equipping us. And so he's equipped us via his word with an understanding of what we are to do to bring his influence instrumentally into this world and into this culture as the leaders that we're called to be. And that is found, of course, in the Bible and in his sacred scriptures. So I'm overjoyed to be at the service of the word here, just opening it with you. We're going to be looking today at chapters five and six. We're going to be finishing the first letter of St. Timothy today, and then we're going to push on to some other themes. But I want us to really take the time first to, to dive deeply into this word, because in first Timothy, you, you really have an excellent example of how St. Paul gives on what was given to him. And that already is an insight because it, the way that you pass on something to someone else reveals a lot of the way that it was passed on to you. I mean, even if you think practically about onboarding in an organization, right? They, they say something like 70% of what determines how long an employee will stay with you is comes from the way that they were onboarded into their position. If you want to invest in anything, you want to in invest in your onboarding process because that's where the person gets trained in just what they're supposed to do, but also in the company that they're working for. Right? And in the same way, when we see St. Paul onboarding St. Timothy here into the job of being a bishop, you see just how, number one, serious he is. Number two, how strict he is. Number three, how detailed he is in what Timothy is supposed to do. And you really see by the way that he's onboarding, so to speak, Timothy here, just how he must have received it from the Lord. Not saying that the Lord did all this to him, but contained inside of Paul's relationship with Jesus and the way that St. Paul visions his own rule as a bishop, as an apostle, his own role as a minister of Christ and as an instrumental leader, therefore, of Jesus, Jesus's rule over the Christian community, you can see in the way that he hands it off to St. Timothy how he saw it himself. And it's almost shocking a little bit when you read First Timothy because 
Paul's speaking to him with command and with seriousness. It's almost like you think, gosh, is Tim- has Timothy done something wrong here? What has Timothy done to deserve such a strong tone from St. Paul? And the answer is nothing. I mean, Timothy, first of all, is a saint. And number two, he's just, you know, he's a young man. It's not that Timothy deserves to be given such strict and, and such strong exhortation. It's that the charge itself is such a sacred thing. Now here, Timothy's receiving the charge to be the overseer of the Christian community. And of course, we all understand that to be sacred. But I think that there's something we can draw from that, even for those of us who live a secular vocation and leadership, or those who are parenting or doing something that doesn't seem directly to be linked to the charge of a bishop. But what we are seeing here is an example of leadership being passed on with his concomitant responsibilities and structures and science. And this is what I want us to then take and apply in our lives. So as before we open this word, let's just begin with a prayer and bow our heads. In the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, O Holy Spirit, Father of the poor, illumine the hearts of thy faithful. Open this word to us that we might understand and love you and become the leaders you're calling us to be. We give you thanks for this opportunity. We beg you for your grace. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. St. John, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, one of the things I'm most fascinated about in, in the job of a Christian leader is that we have to assert ourselves. At the same time, we have to stay humble. And this can really be hard because you almost have two different traditions going on. You have the worldly thing, which says, be at the top of your class, nail all your tests, be competitive, make sure everyone likes you, you know, uh, curry the favor of the people who are above you so that you can rise up in the ladder. You know, if you have competition, drown your competition on your rise to success, right? Run hard in that heated race. That is the race to the top. And then on the other hand, You have this tradition kind of like typified by monks and nuns, you know, of saying we're just going to flee all of this completely and live as if God was the only thing that existed on the face of the earth and basically disappear. I mean, one of the reasons why no one knows any monks is because monks aren't here. Monks are in the mountains. They're in the desert. They're hidden away from the things of this world. And so you can be tempted to think, well, since God has called me to be in this world and I find myself a manager of a restaurant or a doctor or a lawyer, whatever you might be, you're therefore said, well, for me, I have to be like those who are in the world because I belong to this world. And if I don't, I'm going to lose. And therefore, the holy ones are those who are in the monasteries. There's where spirituality lies somewhere on the other side of my retirement, right? It's really hard to find the balance between those two. And St. Paul here understands this. On the one hand, he's nothing but a terrible sinner. He has a past that he wants to forget. He has done terrible things that he regrets. And he's constantly humbled by the fact that Jesus Christ is the unspeakable God who has reached down and spoken to him and called him into his service. And on the other hand, he has to stand in front of kings. He has to stand in front of the wealthy, the rulers of this age, the lawyers and the business people of his time. And he has to try to convince them that Jesus Christ is God. And so you have to be, you have to have a lot of confidence. You have to, I mean, you have to assert yourself in intelligence. It's not the same thing to preach to the poor as to preach to the wealthy, as to preach to those who are seated, those those who are, he has to teach those who taught other people. He has to have debates with the Pharisees and, and the scribes. And at the same time, he has to go towards the utter pagans and bring them to the knowledge of God. This requires so much talent and so much skill and so much self-awareness and self-possession that we're all in awe of St. Paul, and yet he's in awe of Christ. Well, which one is it going to be then? You know, how does he make that balance? That's what he passes on to Timothy, and that's what you and I need to learn to do our jobs as well. This is Father Nathan. I know that many of you listening are looking for a better place to be. You're not happy necessarily with what's going on in the world. You're not happy with where your life is going and you wonder if there's any way to go forward. That's why we started the St. John Leadership Institute in Denver, Colorado. The idea is simple. 
move to Denver, live with a community of your peers, earn a master's degree in any subject from any university, and become a saint while doing it. Check us out at stjohnleadershipinstitute.org. So in 1 Timothy chapter 5, St. Paul starts to answer the question, how is it that we balance the greatness that we need to have if we're going to have any influence in this world? And, and, and God's called us to have that influence, so therefore I have to have a greatness and cultivate my own sense of self and my talents and my skills and the humility that's the prerequisite of the whole thing. Right? Well, First Timothy 5, he starts off, right? And he, and he puts his focus really clearly here on the charge that he's been given. And I think that that's an interesting term. I'm looking here at 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 21. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of the elect angels, I charge you to keep these rules without prejudging, doing nothing from partiality. There's the beginning of the answer for us right there. Notice how strongly St. Paul puts this. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of the elect angels, I. So that's four levels there of authority for Timothy. The authority of Paul over him, which is huge. He's his spiritual father. And he's the one who's taught him how to be a bishop. He's the one who made him to be a bishop. Then you have the angels. Then you have Christ Jesus. And then you have God himself. All of them, you know, in, in their presence, looking down at Timothy, right? <laughs> and it's like, Timothy, in such company, I now tell you, right? I charge you, he says, which means it's a type of commandment, but it's a commandment where you lay, I give you this charge, namely do this, keep these rules without prejudging, doing nothing from partiality. Okay. The word in Greek is do these things almost like without any of yourself being involved. This is the key. You see, if I'm going to be great for my own sake, I'm being great unto folly. This is the worldly sense of greatness where I'm trying to be great so that then I'm ahead of everybody else so that then everybody thinks well of me so that then I don't even know. So somehow I can glorify myself and it's really silly because we're all going to the grave. You know, nobody remembers the greatest boxer in third century Greece, okay? <laughs> but at the time, in third century Greece, there was some kid out there trying to be the greatest boxer and he was sacrificing everything for it. And it's totally silliness because it, that's why they call it vanity. The, the word vain actually comes from the Latin word vanum, which means nothingness, right? So vanity is the pursuit of, as if it were something important of things or something that is actually worthless. So the person who gives themselves to vain pursuits is giving themselves to chasing after the wind. I mean, you can think you have something great in an empty box, but it's because the box is shiny. But when you open a shiny and beautifully wrapped box and there's nothing in it, that's the picture of what vanity is. You go after a prize that's in fact worthless. Right? And, and the world is vain, not because what it's doing isn't spectacular. It's just lacking substance. The things that are on the inside, this is what we must cultivate. And the world and secular vision oftentimes totally neglects the things that are on the inside. Uh, and this is where we Christians step in to say the real value of life is on the inside. And we want to manifest that on the outside. But the goal is on the inside. And therefore, if we lead, we need to demonstrate competence. We need to develop our skills. We need to be people who are confident and who shine brilliantly in front of other people. The trick is that the reason we're doing it is not self-aggrandizement, but it's the service of the one whom we love. Like a mother or father who develop themselves so that they can serve their family all the better. Or like grandparents who bestow all of their retirement and their energies of the retirement onto the littlest members of their family so as to build them up. The people who are underneath great people are always happier. If the great people who are above them use their greatness to serve them. And this is the model. In other words, to look upon your own greatness and your own self-development as an act of service to the one who is above you. 
This is why St. Paul looks at Timothy and he's like, Timothy, I'm giving you this job to lead your people, to lead God's people. And this job is no small thing. He goes on, I mean, chapter five, he's talking about rebuking, you know, people. He's encouraging. He's got to treat older people like a father and younger people as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters. He has to honor widows, make, de- make decisions about who's a false widow and who's a true widow. He's got to make, you know, he's got to rule the Christian community. You can't do that if you're timid and weak. He talked about that already in chapter four, where he says, don't let anyone put you down. You're at the service of Christ. You stand strong. And in chapter 6, he's gonna, he goes on to say all kinds of things that Timothy has to do that are very difficult. He's got to rebuke false teachers. He's got to teach with all strength the people that are in front of them. Timothy has to deliver, and he has to deliver effectively and consistently. And this takes a great man. But St. Paul reminds him that the secret to his greatness does not lie in himself but in the fact that he has been empowered and been given a charge to do from the king of kings. This is how St. Paul puts it here in chapter 6. He goes, he says it so beautifully. He says, I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things, meaning to you as well, don't forget it, Timothy, and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, so he's saying in front of Jesus who himself did spoke well when he was on the earth to keep the commandment or the other ways you could look at it, keep your mandate, keep your office unstained and free from reproach unto the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. I mean, this is, of course, uh, chapter 6, verses 13 through 16. And it's this immensely powerful vision that Paul gives. He's not underestimating Christ in order to tell Timothy to simply develop his humanity in a vacuum. No, he's extolling Christ and the power of Jesus in order that Timothy develop his greatness in a relationship. The greater the king that you serve and the more unutterable be his name and the more exalted that he be, the higher that he calls his servants in his service. We have to not be afraid of developing ourselves because we're not developing ourselves in vanity. We're developing ourselves in an act of service. Now, obviously, this is dangerous. Obviously, this could lead us astray in the sense that our inclination will be to grow ourselves for our own sake and to pursue vanity and to exalt ourselves over our fellow human beings. And this is why I think St. Paul is warning Timothy. Listen, I'm saying this in the name of God and in the name of Christ Jesus and in his presence. I'm telling you, yes, you must lead. Yes, you must assert yourself. But you must always keep in mind that you are nothing in front of the one who is all and that you are his instrument as you assert yourself. It's his greatness and his glory that are going through you. And they will go through you as you assert yourself, but you have to always be humbled before him. In other words, lead out of love. This is Father Nathan. I know a lot of people are formed in leadership in ways that are very practical and efficient. This is good, of course, but is there something more? Coming to the St. John Leadership Institute in Denver, Colorado, young adults are able to learn not only how to lead effectively, but how to lead in the spirit, anchoring a master's degree and specific business skills in prayer and spirituality. Find out more at stjohnleadershipinstitute.org. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, St. Paul really puts his finger on something that we struggle with as leaders. Leadership requires self-development, 
which is a kind of richness. Let's just be honest with you. You go to the greatest universities, you score in the top 10 percentiles, you graduate summa cum laude, you get a job making twice as much as your parents ever made in their life, and you have nowhere to go but up. If you get to travel, you're going and traveling on airplanes, you're going from city to city, you're, you're moving across the country to follow your career. And each step you go up, you go up at the social ladder. Now you're having all kinds of wonderful parties and events in your homes, maybe multiple homes, a boat on the side. And it's because the world is rewarding you for the talent and the skill and the dedication that you have. I mean, if you've gone to school for 12 years in order to perform form certain forms of surgery, you'd almost say, haven't I deserved all that I've gotten? And it might, that's, a, that's one question. And it's almost like an independent question here of the Bible. Do I deserve this? It's like, yeah, maybe you do. Maybe you actually do deserve all of that. I have no idea. The question isn't what you have. The question is what you're going to do with it. St. Paul, for example, here in chapter 6, even goes on and he speaks about those who are rich in this present age. And I like this because a lot of times we focus a lot in our Catholicism on the poor. And of course we should. We are all, you know, preferential option for the poor. But what does that leave people who actually have money? Where does that leave them? Well, St. Paul tells them here in verses 17 to 19. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. So St. Paul is telling here in Timothy, he's like, listen, for those who are like you, Timothy, either rich in the things of this world, which are possessions, or rich in the things of this world, which are skills and ability and human contact and the ability to speak well and a great personality and a natural sense of leadership, all those things which St. Timothy obviously had to have. St. Paul is saying, if you have those things, don't put your hope in them. That's the first line in verse 17. Don't set your hope on the uncertainty of these things. Rather, set your hope on God. So it's not a question of what you have. It's a question of what you do with it. If you have nothing, you can still serve God. If you have many things, then you must serve God. In both circumstances, the focus of St. Paul here is not on who has and who has not, but on what they do with it. And to whom much has been given, much will be expected. If you have been so blessed and you have worked your tail off to achieve the things that you've achieved in yourself and developed yourself and developed your personality and been able to do all of that and you did it, of course you deserve in this world a certain amount of comfort. Of course, you paid for it, right? You paid the price. But let's remember at the same time what we are to do with it. The more that we've been given, the more that we must give in ourselves, by dedicating yourself to making a positive influence in this world. That this is the call to the leader. And to do that, we have to constantly put ourselves underneath our God, underneath the King of Kings, as St. Paul says, and the Lord of Lords, the only sovereign who is immortal and brilliant, so brilliant in light you can't even look upon him. So St. Paul exalts God in front of St. Timothy to say, now serve him. And so we as leaders have this marvelous call to really become contemplatives, to live our spirituality from the inside as if it was everything to us. I mean, gazing at the inaccessible light. The more that we, in other words, become enamored with excellence and the more that we become excellent, the more that we can fall in love with the one who is the most excellent. This is, the, this is the pathway of leadership. As, as you go through the challenges and as you succeed and as you get to see the beautiful influence that you can make in this world redound, you know, from God, the clean restaurant that you manage and that you close and the fidelity that you have to your clients and to your customers, to, to the relationships that you build with coworkers who push yourselves to finish projects on time and, and over the expectation and so forth. You know, you, you can think of the many ways 
That work develops us. All of that is a foretaste for the contemplative. It's a foretaste of the excellence that's found in God, the beauty that's found in the heart of Christ. And the more that we develop it as true servants, the more that we hunger for heaven, which is just a step away. And this is the call to holiness that Christ gives to Timothy. He's like, Timothy, put yourself fully into the job that I gave you. You have to deal with all of this kind of difficulty and challenges of leadership, exhorting people, protecting the flock, being true and all of this stuff. But in the end, let's remember this. Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of the world. If we have food and clothing with these, we shall be content. As he says in verse 11, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness, fight the good fight of faith. Timothy, in other words, put your greatness at the service of others and put your heart at the service of Christ. We who are called into leadership are called into holiness. We're called into a relationship with God that is greater than anything that we have and anything that we do. The more that you have and the more responsible you are to influence this world, the humbler you're called to be before Jesus. After all, our greatness and our impact is completely at his service. And that we can use what we do every day in order to inspire and to deepen that relationship with Jesus, that love affair between your heart and the heart of God. This is our true wealth. This is our true, truly great impact. This is what we were made to bring into the world, to bring this world into God. And blessed are, is he and blessed are we who have received this incredible vocation. Dare great things for Christ. Share your feedback with Father Nathan. Send us an email at info at stjohninstitute.org. That's info at stjohninstitute.org. And don't forget to subscribe to premium video content to form, unite, and inspire you at Eagle Eye Pro on our website, eagleeyeministries.org. That's eagleeyeministries.org.